Thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. I am not going to talk about the first government shutdown. I did experience that in 1995. It's terrible. Uh, I am going to talk about, as you've heard, uh, gender parity and its implications for economic performance. Women's rights are widely understood, not always honored, obviously, to be human rights. But the case that women's rights, that equal rights in polit political representation or the economy or health and education, that those rights are important for economic performance, that's a relatively new argument. And it's an argument that I have had the honor to be involved in. I'm going to talk as an economist. I confess that. I know many people don't like economics. I'll try to make it uh, interesting. But I've looked at this as an economist. I'll also talk as a woman. I have spent a long career in a traditionally male discipline. By the way, I started to study economics at Smith College. There, that's a woman's college. I didn't realize it was a male discipline. No men in the classroom. In any event, I will talk about my experience as a woman as well as my perspective as an economist. So one of the things I was able to do in my life was to serve as the dean of a couple business schools, large global business schools, students from all over the world, businesses from all over the world. And while I was there, I became very aware of the fact that women were not going to go to business school as frequently as you would expect, that business schools like economics are disciplines where you don't find 50% of the students women. In many, many fields now around the world in tertiary education, women are at parity or more than parity, that is more than half of the students. So I started to think about this. Why are women uh, discouraged from going into the business world? Why don't they pursue MBA education? Then really kind of out of the blue, I was sitting as a dean in London, uh, I got an invitation from the World Economic Forum to get involved in a project to look at how inequalities, lack of rights for women, might affect economic performance. Now, the World Economic Forum is a very well-known NGO, and it started its life as an organization trying to compare and measure countries in terms of their economic potential, called competitiveness. How competitive is the United States as a place to do business? How competitive is Germany as a place to do business, or India, or China? or any country. So th this is wor the World Economics Forum's claim to fame to develop a global competitiveness index. People look at it all the time. Business leaders look at it. Political leaders look at it. But gender didn't show up at all in the index, which kind of reflected the fact that the first time I ever went to the World Economic Forum back in, I think, 1989, 5% of the attendees were women. When I went back in the mid-1990s as President Clinton's economic advisor, I brought my spouse, we almost got divorced there, because, well, there were very few women except in the role of spouses. So when I brought my husband in as one of the few women representatives with my spouse, a male, he got a flowered bag and a sleigh ride. <laughs> he was not a happy camper, and he's never gone back. I have uh, been a regular at the World Economic Forum, uh, and I would say now we have 20% women, and we have a global gender gap report because the forum decided that there was increasing interest of political leaders and business leaders around the world and heads of NGOs to actually ask the question, how do gender rights uh, affect economic performance? So we set about doing that. And uh, we put together a report. It's now called the Global Gender Gap Report. Now, I'm going to say right away, I don't recommend reading every word of this on the website. Not because it isn't very, very interesting and important. It is, but it's kind of tedious. There's a lot of graphs. There's a lot of numbers. There's a lot of rankings. So I'm going to try to summarize some of the main points that we have discovered. So the first thing is, what kinds of gender gaps do we think might matter to how productive an economy is, how fast it grows, what its prosperity level is? We, we came up with four general areas, health, education, economic participation and opportunity. I will talk about that probably the most tonight. And uh, political empowerment. And we essentially 
set up a whole bunch of measures in each of these four areas, and we got 132 countries to provide us with measures, and we can measure any country that gives us the data in terms of what I call gender parity. How close are the rights between men and women equal in each of these areas? A score of one in an area means parity. A score of 20% means you got only 20% towards parity. You have closed only 20% of the gender gap in that area. So the next slide pretty much uh, is a slide I've taken from the report. And all, I will sort of, again, just talk about the main points here. First of all, what this is telling us, not a surprise, is that around the world, in all of these 132 countries, when you kind of look at where the inequalities are the greatest, it's in political representation. Now, these political numbers are at the national level. We couldn't get comparable data at the mayoral level, for example, so it probably isn't as bad around the world at the mayoral level. But at the national level, legislative uh, share of women in legislature, share of women in ministry, share of women in the top position, we really have a long way to go in political rights for women. Economics, we've got, doing better, 60, this graph tells you about 60% of the gap between men and women in the economics area has been closed. And here the, the gaps are measured by labor force participation, what percentage of women are actually in the labor force, uh, their wages and how they look relative to men's and their promotion opportunities. You can see the world has actually done a rather good job by now of eliminating gender gaps in education. This is amazing. Around the world, around the world, in developing and developed countries, you see from literacy all the way to tertiary education near parity in male and female uh, sort of levels of educational attainment. Now, that doesn't mean in a poor country there's going to be more lack of literacy, but the lack of literacy is going to be equally distributed between men and women, okay? That's what parity means. It's independent of the level. It's how equal your access is. So this is pretty good news that we've closed those gaps. Now, the last graph here simply kind of is a, is a, is a, it's a relationship graph. Remember, we started this effort with the question, would a country's performance on gender gaps, on gender parity, affect its economic competitiveness? And lo and behold, not knowing we would find that to be a statistically significant relationship, we did. Now, to you in this room, probably that's not a real surprise. I mean, after all, women are half the world's population the potential half the world's labor force, with all of that catch-up in education, half the world's talent. So you would expect that countries that organize themselves to give more and more equal rights to women will end up with a more competitive economy. They will have more talent, it will be more productively uh, distributed around economic activity, they'll need more diversity in decision making, found in, in experiment after experiment to be very positive for productivity. So sure, yeah, gender parity is positively correlated with economic growth, economic competitiveness, economic prosperity. But there are still very large gender gaps around the world. So really, if women are half of the world's labor force, only about half of that female labor force is actively engaged in work. And there are still very dramatic, significant gaps in earnings of men and women who have about the same education, about the same skills, about the same time in work, and are doing about the same occupation. All around the world, you still see significant gaps despite all of those similarities. And then finally, you still see significant gaps in, as you move up the ladder, of women in senior positions, economic positions, of women in entrepreneurship, of women's attainment levels as you move up uh, economic activity. So why? Why? If it's so clear that reducing gender gaps causes an economy to do better, 
If more women in the labor force means longer term, a more talented labor force, a larger labor force, a labor force which tends to be very positively associated with a child with reduction in childhood poverty. Now, in developing countries, one of the most powerful things you can do to develop an economy is educate women and give them a job because they will, in turn, spend a lot of their money on educating their children and will make sure their children go to school and, so, and will also cut down the birth rate so you won't get the population pressure. So if you want to develop a developing economy quick, work on getting rid of gender gaps in economics. Nonetheless, we still have them. Why? Why? Look, there are many reasons for gender gaps around the world, so I want to end by talking about the common one, the one that is as common to everyone in this room in some way, I suspect, and that is social norms. That is expectations about how people balance the, the responsibilities of work and the responsibilities of families. And the social norms every place, including the United States, including the most developed countries in the world, are still that those responsibilities disproportionately lie with women. Now, how do women cope with that? How do families cope with that? Women work part-time much more frequently than men do. Uh, married women with children work, are much more likely to work uh, part-time than unmarried women without children. Those are truth, truths around the world. So one thing is part-time. Another is opting out, opting out strategy. A woman goes into the labor force, has a child, takes some time off. Tries to go back, hard to go back. 75% of the, in a recent survey, 90% of the women in the U.S. who took time off for child reasons wanted to go back to a professional career. Only about 75% of them can find a career. They were paying a wage penalty of 20 to 30%. So the issue of how societies organize themselves to deal with the fundamental issue of if time is limited and families have pressures from work and from uh, children and from family responsibilities, how should society organize itself uh, to deal with these differences? Now, I had two other charts here, but since I'm running out of time, let me just follow this through to think about the U.S. situation right now. The U.S. situation is that we had a lot of progress in the 1980s and in the 1990s of women entering the labor force in large numbers and women's labor force participation rate catching up with men's. The, the gender gap became very small. But then it stalled out. It stalled out. In the 2000s, it's just stalled out, flat, flat. The other thing that stalled out in the United States is there was a lot of progress in the 80s and 90s as women's education increased and as their, wa as their experience uh, increased in the labor force, the wage gap started to shrink between men and women. But then again, stalled out in the 19, late 1990s and in the 2000s. Why? What's, what's the matter? Why are we stalling out? And I think there you could say, that there are increasing pressures on families in the United States. There are increasing pressures from work. We saw an increase, a significant increase in hours worked, a significant increase in, therefore, the trade-offs between having a career working full-time and taking care of the family. And we have had no policy responses to help. No policy responses to help. What do the European economies have? They have child care support policies. They have paid leave policies that are very generous. Parental paid leave. A husband, a male spouse, can take uh, the time off rather than a female spouse. They have very strong protections for part-time workers. So if a woman has to go into part-time work for a while, she will not take a huge wage cut. She'll take a, wage cu she'll take a cut in the number of hours she works, but not a huge wage cut. The U.S. ranks kind of dead last in terms of family-friendly policies. And therefore, ranking dead last, we have seen our progress on reducing gender gaps in labor force participation and wages. We've seen our progress stop. So I will give you my personal story and relate just to the story of uh, some of the literature out there right now. I get asked a lot um, by people, well, 
you had it all, so you managed to balance family and work. Uh, so people can do it. Why do you think we need any policies for that? Well, first of all, I had an academic career. Academic careers are wonderful. If you postpone having children until after tenure, which I did, all my male advisors told me, do not have a child until you have tenure, I listened, um, you can pretty much go part-time, you have flexible hours, you could work on a paper one year and not work on a paper, stop going to conferences, stop, teach half-time. Uh, you can opt out and move in and out uh, and yet retain your position. Boy, most people can't do that. Secondly, I had a stay-at-home spouse. Do you know that uh, about 75% of men who have top positions in U.S. business have stay-at-home spouses, 75%. So I had a stay-at-home spouse. This was a huge help. He was a writer. When I had an extreme job in Washington, believe me, working as an economic advisor for any president is an extreme job, the family had the job. It was everybody's job. It wasn't just my job. It was my husband's job. It was my son's job. By the way, after four years of that job, my husband and son said to me, we're leaving. <laughs> we're, we're finished with this job. If, if you want this job, please stay, but we're going. Was that just a woman's issue? No. Bob Reich is a good friend of mine. Probably some of you have seen him speak here. Yes. Bob Reich had the same thing with his family. They said to him, we're leaving. We don't want this job anymore. He left too. So I, I say that if you have a uh, supportive spouse and you have an academic career and you don't have an extreme job, yes, you can have it all. And then even then you can't have it all because I, have, I gave something up, the family gave something up, and I think that was the right thing to do. I only bring this up because one of the books that everybody's reading right now, of course, is called Lean In. And lean in uh, hypothesis is that if women can close the gender gap themselves by leaning in, by essentially being assertive about their negotiation for a salary, asking for projects, being competitive, uh, putting yourself in the right place at the right time, calling your colleagues on being uh, inappropriate to you, all of those things. I did all of those things. I've done all those things. I've leaned in. Okay. <laughs> my husband leaned in, my son leaned in, we all leaned in. But the point is, I really feel, and this is a serious point, think about this. This is a problem. We see gender gaps all around the world. What is common all around the world is that families have to balance the competing demands of families and of work, and that social norms every place still put that burden primarily on women. So I think that we should have our government lean in with some helpful policies. <laughs> yes. And I think we should have our business organizations lean in with some helpful policies. And I'll give you a really interesting little piece of news I just heard as I was coming over here tonight. The city of San Francisco has apparently decided that it is going to move to flex time, telecommuting, distance, job sharing for government officials in order to be family friendly. So once again, California is leading the charge. Thank you very much. <laughs>